So welcome everybody to the first, first lecture in a series about statistics, more specifically about error analysis in, in biology. Um, let's start with a simple question. Why do we need errors or uncertainties in biology? So let, let's have a look at this example when you consider a micro error experiment where you compare control and treatment. And let's look at one particular gene, for example, filagrin. And imagine then in this particular experiment out of your device, you, you got two numbers, about 42,000 and about 20,000 in some arbitrary units, which tells you expression level of this gene. <clears throat> and you look at these numbers, you might say, oh, there is about twofold change in intensity, and biologists like this twofold change. So you can say, well, great, this gene is repressed in our treatment, so that's, that's a good finding. Except, if you manage to repeat this experiment many, many times, for example, 30 times, and do, did 30 measurements of this gene under two different conditions, you might, for example, get the following result. It might turn out that there is a quite high variability in gene expression in both conditions, and it's just, when you did one experiment, you were unlucky that in first experiment you got sort of a high-ish value, and it's around here, it's marked by the circle, and under the treatment you got a slightly lowish value, so there's a quite a difference between them, but this difference is due to high variability in both uh, cases. And if you take all these results together and calculate mean and error of the mean, and I will explain later how to calculate it, you get these two, two numbers, and if you look carefully at these error bars, they basically overlap. Because variability is so high, these two conditions overlap, and these distributions are very similar. So if you, if you, if you do, for example, a t-test, it will give you a p-value of these two things of about 0.2. It tells you that there is no statistically significant difference between these things, but if you do just one measurement, you don't know about it. So obviously, a measurement without error is meaningless, and that's what my physics teachers, I studied physics, and that's what they used to tell me, and I would try to show this throughout all these lectures, that this is a very important thing to keep in mind. There will be lots of maths, uh, well, maybe not lots, but there will be maths in, in these lectures. Uh, you can't do statistics without mathematics, it's impossible, so there will be some equations for Generally, they are going to be rather simple. There is no advanced mathematics here. Uh, it's basic. There will be also some more complicated concepts introduced. So please do not run out after the first lecture. And there will be theoretical concepts in the beginning and more practical things later. The table of contents of all our talks is like this. I will start today with probability distributions and then later on we'll explain random variables, statistical estimators, confidence intervals, that's a very important part where I explain how to actually calculate errors or uncertainties, some practical things, how to present error bars, and at the end I will talk about error propagation and linear regression uh, and errors of linear regression, and that will be in six talks. The confidence interval uh, is the biggest part, it will take two lectures, but today is about probability distributions. Let's start with an example. <clears throat> so imagine another experiment. You count bacteria in a sample using dilution platings and you see colonies of bacteria in, in, uh, in every plate. And you did the experiment in six replicates. And what you get is the following numbers. Five, three, three, seven, three, and then nine. So there is a difference. Replicated experiments under the same conditions, they show different results. So experimental result is a random variable. That's the first concept I'm going to introduce today. And it follows a certain probability distribution, which I explain as well. So based on this one particular sample of six numbers, you can make predictions about future experiments. You can, do, you can calculate errors, uncertainties, and a few other things. So let's start with probability distributions and here is a quote from Steve Agent Gould, so he was a biologist, uh, so it's quite important, he, it's a point of view of a biologist and he said that misunderstanding of probability may be the greatest of all general impediments to 
scientific literacy. And I'm going to change it a little bit and improve your understanding of, of probability. So what is a random variable? Well, <laughs> a bit tautological definition would be that a random variable can assume random values. There is a more specific mathematical definition of a random variable, but it's a bit complicated and uh, we don't really need it. From a practical point of view, for us, for biologists, it's that a numerical outcome of an experiment, that's the random variable. So, example, you throw two dice <clears throat> and you can get any number between 2 and 12, yes? So, every time you repeat this experiment, you throw two dice, you can get a different number. Uh, a non-random variable will be a number of mice when you have them on your, on your bench and you, when you have five mice, well, there is five mice, you can count them again, you will get five and five again, it's not going to change. However, it's not that simple <clears throat> because uh, if you, rep if you do, for example, a survival experiment and you count number of surviving mice after, let's say, a few days, in one experiment you might have three mice two of them will be dead. In another experiment you might have five or four or two, so it will change from experiment to experiment. And in this case the number of mice is a random variable because it will change from experiments, between experiments. So all values in biological experiments from a practical point of view, they are all random variables. <coughs> and what you need to know is there are, generally speaking, two types of random variables. There is a discrete random variable which can assume only certain values and typically that will be integer numbers like number of mice here. And a continuous variable which can assume any value, for example a weight of a mice, if you put it on the scales and, and weight. And from here we go to probability distributions. Uh, so I use this notation where random variables are marked by, I, I use capital letters for, for random variables. So, so probability distribution of a random variable x can be plotted like this and it defines the probability of finding this random variable x in a certain range of values. So if you look at a discrete probability distribution, the value that can be assumed by this variable are k, so they could be 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on and so forth. And this, you must have seen a plot like this before, this is a probability distribution of random variable x and there are possible values here and these are probabilities. So for example, probability that this variable uh, has a value of 1 is about maybe 6-7% and so on. And for, uh, so probability that it is 5 is 15%, probability that it is 6 is 11%, and then there is 6% of this variable being 7. So this is probability of, uh, this is the notation, p of x equals k. It's a probability of finding x equals k. Now you can add these things together and the probability of x being between 5 and 7 is just a sum of these three numbers, it's, it's 0.32. So you can add these things up. For a continuous variable, you don't have specific probabilities like here for value of 1, 2 and 3 because they can assume any value. So what you have is this function and it's called probability density function and it tells you again the probability of finding this variable in a certain range of values. For example, probability that x is greater or equal 6, this, would be the area under this curve marked by the dark blue colour. Probability of x between 3 and 6 is, well, this. And if this is 0.2 and this is 0.36, you tell me, what's the probability of x being less than 3? Quick calculation. 44. They add up to 1. So the total area under this curve is always 1, as the total probability, and if you add these three areas, 0 0.44, 0 0.36 and 0.20, it will give you Point, uh, it will give you one. One thing you need to remember about uh, continuous variability is the probability of x being equal to a given value is zero. That's because if you imagine this area here being compressed and two, 
to uh, the, the size of this interval getting smaller and smaller, in the limit, when it collapses to nothing, that gives you probability of zero. So probability of x being equal exactly 5 is actually zero. Okay, probably the most important probability distribution you need in exper you, you find in experimental sciences in biology is uh, Gaussian distribution, or otherwise called normal distribution. Uh, it's the probability density function is expressed by this formula, and if you plot it, this is what it looks like for the mean of 10 and standard deviation of 1.5. So this is the bell-shaped curve. It's centered at its mean, which is mu, and the standard deviation of this distribution tells you how wide it is. So these, these numbers are here. There is x minus mu. This is the mean. This is the standard deviation. Uh, standard deviation squared is called variance. <coughs> And this probability distribution is called normal because it appears in nature very often. There are lots of natural processes in biology and other sciences that follow this distribution. Uh, now, about area under the curve, I told you that it represents probability. There are a few numbers to remember. <clears throat> So, first of all, probability of being within one sigma or one standard deviation of the mean is about two-thirds, 68.3%. And this is this dark blue area. So this is mean, this is minus one sigma, this is plus one sigma. So this is the probability of being within one standard deviation of the mean. And it's here in this table. So this is probability of being within this area. And this is the probability of being outside this area and the odds of being outside are about one in three. Actually, in statistics, we quite often look at these tail probabilities. So we are quite often interested in, for example, if you look at this probability here, this light shaded area plus this one, this will give you a probability of being outside two sigma, which is this one, about 4.6%, or odds one in 20. One sort of a magical number you need to remember <coughs> is that, that 1.96 sigma corresponds to 95% probability. This is something which is often used in, in biology. Either 5% p-value or 95% confidence interval. This is 1.96 sigma. It's almost 2, so it will be from somewhere here to somewhere there, just, just below this line. The, the differences between 2 and this is, is not very large. So just remember 1.96. We'll come back to this later many times. This is an example of actual measurements that follow Gaussian distribution. What I plotted here is the result from Hong Kong um, survey where they surveyed 25,000 individuals. I think these were adolescent youths and they measured them. They measured height and weight of each of them. So the mean is 172.70 centimeters. This is standard deviation, almost five centimeters. And the bar plot represents actual data. And the blue, dark blue line is the Gaussian distribution with this mean and this standard deviation. It, as you can see, data follow this distribution very closely. Speaking about Gaussian distribution, I should mention Gauss, Carl Friedrich Gauss was a brilliant German mathematician. If you ever studied mathematics, you will see Gauss here and there, basically it's all over. He, he invented basically many, many fields in, in, in mathematics. One of the things he did, and he was very proud of this, he constructed a regular, regular heptadecagon using only ruler and compass. This is an old, from ancient Greece, a method. You have just these two devices, and you want to construct some complex figures. So. Those of you who speak Greek, can you tell me, heptadecagon, how many sides does it have? Anyone? Hepta, that will be, decagon, that will be 10, and hepta, that will be 7, so it's a 17. So it's a regular polygon, like this one here, with 17 sides, and he requested this to be engraved on his tombstone, but the mason, he looked at this and said, no way, mate, I can't do it. It's just too complicated. It will look like a circle. So it never happened. 
And, when, <laughs> and the, the normal distribution is called Gaussian because he used it a lot, but actually uh, it was first formulated by Abraham de Moivre, which was way uh, before Gauss was even born. So uh, probably it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a very correct name, but it, it's been used, Gaussian, so we still use Gaussian distribution. Let's do a little exercise with Gaussian distribution. So imagine an obesity study in mice where you have a sample of 100 mice and you find body weight of each of them. And they are presented here in this diagram. And you find from this sample that you have mean of 20 grams and standard deviation of 5 grams. Now consider one mouse, let's call it Jerry, and its weight is 30 grams. So it's quite big for, for a typical mouse and it's marked here by a red circle. So, what is the probability of Jerry being that fat? So here is our Gaussian probabilities again. So we assume that um, the weight distribution is uh, the normal or Gaussian distribution. So if it is 30 grams, how many standard deviations are we away from the mean? Two. We are two standard deviations away, so we look at these probabilities. You could probably say that probability of Jerry being that fat is 4.6%, but is it? Well, it's a little bit more complicated. So if we are two sigma away, well, the probability of him being exactly 30 grams is zero, as I said, because that's the continuous distribution. Probability of Jerry being fatter, uh, having weight more than 30 grams, is actually 2.3%, because the probability from this table is complete outside two-tail probability. So one tail is 2.3%. So basically, depending what question you ask, whether it's a probability of Jerry being that fat or probability of Jerry being that far from the mean, being that different, it could be either 2.3 or 4.6%. However, it doesn't really make him an outlier in biological or statistical sense. Because if you, with probability 2.3%, if you have a sample of 100 mice, on average you observe maybe two mice of this weight or heavier, just because rare events happen in large samples. If you have a sample of tens of thousands of, for example, genes, and you look at gene expression, you have to be very careful what you call an outlier in this case. So, Jerry is perhaps fat, but he's not a statistical outlier in a Gaussian distribution. Uh, another distribution which is linked to normal distribution is a log normal distribution. And you will see it in biology actually quite often. So, it is a probability distribution. Sorry, log normal distribution is a probability distribution of a random variable whose logarithm is normally distributed. I realize this is not very clear, so let's have a look at this example. This is real life example from mass spectrometry. This is a distribution of some intensities of, of proteins. And if you plot this distribution directly from your experiments, there is about 96,000 data points here. <coughs> and you plot frequency <coughs> distribution of them, this is what it looks like. It's very skewed, it's very narrow here, and there is a very, very long tail. However, if you take a logarithm of your numbers, take a logarithm of each measured value and plot the distribution of them, it looks very different. It looks almost normal, almost Gaussian. So the logarithm of x is normally distributed. That means that x is log normally distributed. So this is log normal distribution. And you can do it either way around. So you take log normal variable, take a logarithm of this, and you'll get a normal variable or vice versa, you can take a normal variable, do an exponent, and what you get is a log normal variable. So these variables can be very asymmetric, and actually it's worth taking logarithms of these data. <coughs> so look, look at these data more carefully. If you, let's call it PSD, a fraction of data which are within mean plus minus one standard deviation. And you remember that in Gaussian distribution, it's about two thirds, yes? So if you do an experiment and you, and you know it's roughly normally distributed, you expect two thirds of your data to be within min, mean plus minus one sigma. If you calculate mean and standard deviation for this distribution, 
you see that standard deviation is actually much larger than the mean and about 96% of data points are within mean plus minus standard deviation. So this is the mean, this is mean plus standard deviation and mean minus standard deviation is negative as outside this picture. So most of your data are here and this is because this distribution is very skewed, very strange, very asymmetric. However, if you take a logarithm and now calculate mean of logarithms, which is different than this mean, and then standard deviation, then about 67% of data are within mean plus minus one standard deviation. So this, you, you, you might have heard this before, that about two-thirds of data points are within one standard deviation from the mean, but this happens only and only when the distribution of your data is approximately Gaussian. It won't work here for log normal distribution. And, <clears throat> and the recommendation would be every time you have data which are log normally distributed, take logarithms of your data and then do more calculations. So log normal distributions, where do you see them in biology, in gene expression? and you can do either RNA-seq experiment or microarray. Typically these data are log normally distributed. Mass spectrometry, similarly. Uh, drug potency, IC50s, are usually log normally distributed. That's why you typically would take a logarithm of this and then do more calculations. So difference in log space is a ratio in linear space. This is a very uh, obvious identity. And that's why in, in these cases, for example, when you look at gene expression, you would calculate a ratio or, or log ratio. This is a typical quantity that you would calculate to express differences between two conditions. It doesn't matter whether you use log base 2 or 10 or a natural logarithm. It doesn't matter as long as we are consistent. However, it does matter in plots. And my recommendation here would be to use log base 10. The reason for this is that um, if you see 6 in, uh, in, in, in logarithms, then you know that 10 to the power 6 is 1 million. So if you see in your graph 4, 5, 6, 7, you know it's 10,000, 100,000, million and so on. If you do the same with, with a scale which is log base 2, it's not that obvious. You know that if it is 1, then the ratio is 2. If it is 2, then the ratio is 4. But if it is 12, does anybody, does anyone, can, can you tell me just from top of your head what's 2 to the power 12? Not easy. It's 4096. So if you make a plot and you plot logarithm base 2 of your data, it's not that easy to read as a log base 10 in a, in a, in a plot. And again, another, another historical mention. Uh, if we talk about logarithms, you have to mention John Napier, who was a Scottish mathematician and astronomer. <coughs> he wrote this book, uh, which was an introduction to logarithms, because he basically invented logarithms and published first tables of, of natural logarithms. Uh, he was born in Manchester Castle in Edinburgh, which is just in the middle of a campus of uh, John Napier University now in Edinburgh, named after him. <clears throat> he created uh, Napier's bones. This is, these are Napier's bones, sort of a long sticks with numbers on them. It was the first practical calculator. It allowed for multiplication, division, and I think taking a square root of numbers by just shifting them. He also <laughs> had an interest in theology, he calculated that based on the Bible, he calculated the date of the end of the world somewhere between 1688 and 1700. And he wasn't the only one who did this. <laughs> he was apparently, apparently, that's just a rumor, he was involved in alchemy and also in necromancy. So a uh, Renaissance man. <clears throat> right, the next distribution is a Poisson distribution, which is a counting distribution. So, Let's start with this experiment. So if you consider a radioactive decay where an atomic nucleus can decay spontaneously and we cannot predict this. We can observe it, we can put a detector next to a radioactive sample and just count these decays. And we can observe them and this is a result of such an observation marked here by black dots. So each black dot is just one recorded radioactive decay event. 
So we don't know when they are going to happen, but we can say something about the mean statistical behavior. So if we divide time scale into bins of one second, we can then count how many events we have in one second. So this one, in this first second, we observed two events. In the second bin, we observed zero events, nothing happened. And then one event, and then suddenly six, and then two, and so on, and so forth. So this is an example of a random variable, which changes. Every time you do a measurement, you get a different result. And if you continue this measurement for a very, very long time, and then plot frequency distribution, how often you observe zero counts, how often you observe one count, and so on. This is the probability distribution you are going to get, and this is the Poisson distribution. So it tells you that probability of observing, for example, one count is about 10, 11 percent or so. So this event happens with a probability of 11 percent. The most probable uh, thing is a bin with three counts in it. And if you calculate the mean count per bin, it's in this case is three and a half counts per second. So we don't know when an event is going to happen, but we can calculate probabilities. So this applies to any, this probability distribution can be applied to any counts in time or space. It doesn't have to be radioactive decay. It doesn't have to be time bins. So you can count, for example, number of deaths in a population. You can count number of cells in a counting chamber, and then your bin will be the size of a counting chamber. You can count number of mutations in a DNA fragment, so your bin is the size of the DNA fragment, and so on. And they all should follow roughly uh, Poisson distribution. So from statistical point of view, Poisson distribution happens when you observe random and independent events. They cannot be correlated. They have to be independent. I will explain this a little bit later. And the probability of observing exactly k events is expressed by this equation. It really doesn't matter. It's, it's quite complicated to calculate. You have a factorial here. So if you want to calculate it for k of 100, it's rather difficult. Fortunately, there are some approximations which make it much, much easier. So Poisson distribution is characterized by only one variable, which is the mean count rate. And standard deviation is not a three parameter. So if you remember in Gaussian distribution, you had two parameters. There was the mean, where the distribution was centered, and there was standard deviation, the width of this distribution. And you could play with them. You can shift distribution left and right and made, make it wider or narrower. Poisson distribution has only one free parameter. So once you set your mean, or calculated it from your data, then you should know standard deviation of variance. And for large mean Poisson distribution approximates Gaussian, and you can see it here. So these are examples of Poisson distribution for the mean of 0.3, 1, 4, and 10. And for large mean, the, what you see, the black line, is the Gaussian distribution with the same mean and standard deviation being square root of the mean. So these distributions become quite similar here. This is an example, very old example from 19th century of uh, Poisson distribution. This is actually the first work that considered this distribution. It came from Stanislaus von Bortkevich. He was uh, a Russian economist and statistician of Polish origin, and he worked in Germany, a typical postdoc, you could say. And he wrote, in 1898, he wrote this work, Das Gesetz der Kleinen Zahlen, which means Anybody speaks German? <laughs> the law of small numbers. And this is what, what it's about Poisson distribution. It's about small numbers. And what the, an example he, he did there, well, he, he counted number of soldiers in the Prussian army killed by horse kicks. And he got lots of data from 10 army corps, 20 years worth of data. So he calculated deaths per year per army corps. And that was his space-time bin, year army core, and he just did counts. And this is what he got. So actual data is this broad, uh, brighter uh, bins, 
and the blue, dark blue bin, sorry, dark blue bars here are Poisson distribution. You see the data follow the Poisson distribution quite nicely. <clears throat> now, what happened is he was actually commissioned to do this by the army because one year in one call there were four deaths by horse kicks and army started uh, an investigation. They thought there must be some negligence that this thing happened. So what von, von Bortkevich calculated this distribution and well, the mean here was 0.61 deaths per call per year and actually you see, this is the probability of having four deaths in one year in one army corps. It's, well, it's small, but it's not negligible. And he calculated this, and this probability, if you have 10 calls, because he got 10, is 0.035. It's about 3.5% to happen. So on average, it should happen once in about 29 or 30 years. So he calculated, yes, this is just a random event. If you, if you observe your data for long enough, it will eventually happen. So there was nothing unnatural in this, it just happens from time to time. And that leads us to something which is called inter-arrival time. It stems from the Poisson distribution. So we could ask a question, how long do we need to wait for the next event to happen? So in radioactive decays, or in this case, how long do you have to wait for this event of four deaths in one, one army core to happen? And the time between these two events, delta t, it's called inter-arrival time. And it's also a random variable. And this random variable has this sort of a cumulative distribution, one minus e to the power minus mu t, where mu is the mean from the Poisson distribution. Now, what does it mean? This is the probability that the time between two events, or how long you have to wait for the next event, is less than a given number t. And if you plot it, you get this curve. So basically, if you wait, for example, 20 years, the probability of this unlikely event with four deaths is about 40%. If you wait, for example, 60 years, the probability will be 80%, and so on. So the longer you wait, the more probable is that your event eventually happens. This is the mean. This is our mean inter-arrival time. It corresponds to 1 over mu. And the mu, if we come back here, was 0.61 deaths per core year. So if you multiply it by 10, because you have 10 cores, 1 over mu would be about 29 years. So on average, you would have to wait 29 years for this event to happen. By the way, these are random events, so if you have to wait on average 29 years, it doesn't mean that it happens every 29 years. So if, uh, if you read in a newspaper that a volcano erupts every 100 years and the last eruption was 100 years ago, so it's overdue and it will, it's going to happen right now, that's not true. What they mean by saying it, it happens every 100 years, it's on average every 100 years, but it's a random process. It can happen very quickly in a succession. It can be dormant for hundreds of years. So, yeah, random events are not periodic. Now, you can use exactly the same formula and calculate probability for something uh, different from just everyday life. So imagine that you play national lottery once a week, okay? And the probability of winning is probability of choosing six balls out of 39 randomly. You can calculate, this is a simple calculation, it's about 1 in 13 million. So if you play once, you have a chance of winning the jackpot 1 in 13 million. Now, if you play every week for a long time, what would be, try to guess, what would be your inter-arrival time, mean inter-arrival time? How long would you have to wait for the next jackpot to happen on average? Try to guess. It's, it's simple calculation, but I want to see your guess. How long would it happen before it happens? 10,000 years. 10, years. Another idea? Anyone? Just take a wild guess. 269,000 years. So if you play national lottery, you are going to win maybe once in 269,000 years if you play it once a week. So good luck. Let's do together one more uh, uh, exercise in, in Poisson distribution, so I hope it will help you understand it better. 
Right, this is our Poisson law. This is the probability of variable x being equal to k, as expressed by this formula. Now imagine you experiment when you transfect a marker in a population of cells and you have 300,000 cells and you know from protocol that it functionally integrates with the genome at a rate of 10 to minus 5. Okay, so that will be a typical transfection experiment and now the question is what is the probability of having at least one cell with that marker? So you have just two numbers, you have a formula and that's the question. So let, let's, let's try to do this together. So first of all we need to calculate the mean expected number of marked cells. That, that will be this mu mean. What is the mean number from these two things of transfected cells? Anyone can see it? So you have 3 times 10 to the 5th cells and the probability of transfection is 10 to minus 5. So what's the expected number of observed transfected cells? Well, you just multiply these two numbers, yes? It's 3. <laughs> yes, Jeff is showing 3. It's 3. You have 3 times 10 to the 5 and probability is 10 to minus 5. So on average you would observe three cells which are transfected. Now, the question was, what's the probability of having at least one cell with the marker? The easiest way of doing this is to calculate the probability of having no cells at all and then take one minus that, okay? So we can use Poisson law, this equation, to calculate the probability of x being zero. And you just use this formula, our mean is three, 3 to the power 0, e to minus 3 divided by 0 factorial, which actually is 1 by definition. And that's 1, e to minus 3, <coughs> sorry, e to minus 3 is about 0.05, you can do it with a calculator. So this probability is about 5%. This is the probability of having no transfected cells at all. So the probability of having at least one transfected cell will be 95% from this data. This is just a simple example of how can you use Poisson distribution in practice. And the last thing I want to mention today very quickly is a, the binomial distribution. Um, so it refers to trials and successes and failures. It sounds a little bit out of context in biology, but actually it has its applications. So imagine a series of N trials. In our case, in this example, would be tossing a coin. So you take a coin and you throw it eight times and every time you check whether you have a head or tails. And let's call heads success. So in every trial you can have either success or failure. This is binomial distribution. There are two possibilities. So probability of success is P and probability of failure obviously is 1 minus p. There are only two possibilities. In our case, this p is 0.5, it's 50% because it's a coin, so, and 1 minus p is also 50%. And now we ask a question, what is the probability of having exactly k successes in n trials? For example, in this diagram you see, what is the probability of having exactly one head if you toss a coin eight times. This is, this is for n of eight. And this probability is about, I don't know, 3% or so, maybe less. The probability of having four heads it's, is much higher and then it drops down again. This is the binomial distribution. And the mean of binomial distribution is NP. So this is number of trials times the probability so if you have 100 trials, you throw the coin 100 times and probability is 50%, on average you will get 50 heads and 50 tails. And the standard deviation is expressed by this formula. It will be relevant a little bit later, so I just leave it here without any, any explanation. For large and binomial distribution approximates Gaussian, you can even see it here, it sort of resembles this bell curve, where when n is of tens or hundreds, it really looks like, like a Gaussian distribution. And it's got actual applications in, in statistics, in error analysis. First of all, random errors, and I will 
show you in the second, uh, I will show it in the second talk, that random errors are distributed with binomial distribution. And it's also very useful in error of proportion, in error of the median. When you calculate these things, you need to use binomial distribution. This is why I mentioned this here. I won't go into details of this, but I want to explain just one thing. <coughs> so if you, if you look at this distribution, the probability of having, for example, four heads in eight coins is much higher than probability of having no heads at all. Why is it so? Why is this probability much larger than, than this probability? Can anyone tell me? Intu what's your intuition? If you, for example, throw eight coins together, you will find four, of the four tails much, with much higher probability or four heads with much higher probability than all of them being the same. Why is it so? Anyone? <laughs> Jeff? <laughs> well, there is always 50-50 chance, but it's, it's not about this probability. This probability doesn't really matter. It's about how your things are distributed, how many ways you can draw a given number of coins. So probability of having eight heads, uh, if head is a success, then it will be this one. So this is probability of having eight heads. There is only one way of having eight heads out of eight coins, just eight heads, that's it. But probability of, se or, or the, there are many more ways of getting four possible heads. You can have head, 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 tail, 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 or head, 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 tail, head, tail, 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 and so on and so forth. There are actually 70 ways of arranging heads and tails uh, when you have four of them each out of eight coins. So this, you will observe many, many more events, possibilities here than, than here. So probability of having, having four heads and four tails is much larger than the probability of having eight heads, for example. This is just how many, how you can distribute things in many ways. Okay, so let's finish this talk with a little exercise for you. I plotted a few distributions, a few samples of data points, and they are distributed with a certain probability distribution, and I want you to guess what probability distribution it is, and there is also a mean and standard deviation. We can probably skip this now, but have a look at this for a moment and let's, let's do it together. So, the first one. What do you think? What sort of probability distribution is it? Anyone? Thank you, Gert. I can't hear you. Speak up. Gaussian? Maybe. Maybe. Well, it's not very much concentrated in the middle and around the tails, maybe. What is this one then? We'll come back to this in a moment. What's this probability distribution? Look, it's very asymmetric. It's concentrated here and there are just a few points. Sorry? Log yeah, log normal. That's, that's probably log normal distribution. What about this one? It's a little bit similar to this one, but look at numbers where they fall. That's a discrete probability distribution, yes? So probably, speak up. <laughs> what, what is it? What, which discrete probability distribution I described first? Poisson distribution, yes. And these two, they look very similar, but again, there is a difference. This is a continuous distribution where it's discrete. So what is this one? That's Gaussian, it's concentrated in the middle and kind of getting less probable around. And this one? <laughs> it's a Poisson distribution. The difference, they look very similar, I told you that with large numbers, large and Poisson distribution looks very much like Gaussian distribution, except that it's a discrete, so you can, only, you can have only integer numbers, while this could be an any number. So the first one, that was a trick question because I didn't really tell you about it, this is the uniform distribution where probability is the same across a given range. It's a very, very simple distribution. And the mean here is about 3.5 and this is the standard deviation. This is log normal. It's, you, can, the, you can see that it's very, very skewed, but it's a very long tail here. The mean is again 3.5. You see this is a different scale here. This is from 2 to about 5. 
this goes up to 15. And yet the mean of these two distributions and the standard deviations are practically the same. So if you want to judge your distribution by its mean and standard deviation, you might make a mistake if your distribution is log normally distributed because it looks very, very different. This is the Poisson distribution, mean of four. We are right in the middle, so this is actually median here, but it equals to the mean. And these are Gaussian and Poisson distribution with exactly the same parameters, mean of 100 and standard deviation of 10. And that's everything for today. If you want to look at handouts, they are available at this web address. Thank you.